are the stock market. The two things I like to see rise are the stock market and the number of participants in a <laughs> webinar all the time. Those are the two things that make me very, very happy to see those things happen. Anybody, anyway, I should say welcome to everybody out there. And um, it is our first uh, webinar for MTW of the year. Um, those of you who are veterans, grizzled veterans of MTW, you know the drill. Uh, certainly come in and let us know where you're coming in from on the chat. Uh, where you're going, how things are going for you, et cetera. If you do use the chat, please make sure to select everybody. And uh, also we can all see your comments and they don't just end up coming to the panelists because everyone benefits from everybody. And it's great to see uh, so many regulars coming in. We love our regulars. However, if you're new, hopefully um, you'll become a regular and hopefully you will rejoice in the camaraderie and conviviality of the online community that is MTW and all of the MTW people. And great wine. And the great wines that make up Master the World, um, chosen by myself and my fellow panelists. Tim, this is the first time I've seen you on top and me in the middle and Madeline in the bottom, but that's <laughs> that's cool too. I like that. It sort of it's kind of like a Poos Cafe, Evan. You a just never know. Yeah. <laughs> or, or for those of you who are old enough to remember it, one, two, three, Jello. Do you remember one, two, three, Ooh. Jello? Oh man. Ooh. I was still yep. living overseas, so I ah. missed one, two, three jello. Okay. Yep. Anyway, I once <laughs> anyway, welcome again, uh, all of you who are joining us today. For those of you who are new to uh, to Master the World, uh, please uh, join in in the chat. Let us know where you're coming in from. Um, you can let us know how the weather is or not, but but just sort of let us know you're here. And once again, please choose all participants or everybody in the chat feature, which is what we use not only to chat, say hi, um, do all that good stuff, but we also use that for our, our Q&A. It's hard to go back and forth between the Q&A feature and all that. So we use chat for everything. On that lovely note, um, my name is Evan Goldstein. I'll reintroduce myself again right after we, we start that. And you're probably wondering, for those of you who are um, regulars, where Lee Mania is today. And unfortunately, um, uh, other things are pressing in her uh, life and schedule right now. So she's not with us today. But fear not, between this tag team of myself, Madeline and Tim, and Silka, who is behind the scenes, who's always at these webinars uh, anyway, we are going to, to manage and master all of this as if Li Meng weren't there. Now, I know that's hard to do because she's got some big shoes to fill, but I'm hopeful that between the four of us, um, we can make things happen. So on that note, I'm just going to say a preemptive thank you to Tim. Thank you to Madeline and a double thank you to Silka behind the scenes for uh, for handling it. And um, Silka, if you wouldn't mind going back one slide for a second, I just want to whip through our things here. Y'all are doing good on the on the hellos and using of the chat and using everyone send virtual hugs. For those of you who are uber competitive, you know that we have an ongoing leaderboard to see who does the best. And if you go in there um, through the MTW website, when you're in tasting wine, uh, you have a choice. There's a little tab at there that says join the leaderboard. And if you want to, the code is CW72. And you can see how you're doing for anyone else who's going against that. I would encourage people to ask questions. Uh, the questions are important. That's what the chat feature is for. And we will address questions either in real time, most notably by Madeline and Tim, or um, at the ends of individual wines where we sort of uh, bring up, are there any other questions? And we might re-bring up a question or whatever. And then obviously um, the recording is always shared on our YouTube channel afterwards, and you will do that. If you want to know what's in the wines, in the kits, and you're not doing the blind tasting, um, you can do so by hitting that QR code. That'll reveal the wines that are there, but not necessarily in the order. It's an alphabetical order. If you hit the thing again, it'll give you the order. But if you want to go blind, don't do that too quickly. Uh, and in the meantime, just to show you the visuals there of what we uh, what you see when you kind of click through and do all that. And for those of you who haven't taken advantage of the online tool that is the blind tasting grids and keys and all that, I encourage you to do so. We put a lot of time, effort, and work into it. And there's some really powerful information there. So without further ado, let's get this show on the road. So welcome, everybody, to Kit 150A. If you're not sure you've got 150A, look on the side spine of your box, because there is a sticker there that will tell you there, and that will make sure that you're following one through six, the order of the wines that we're going to be doing today. As you know, we always um, take them in order. Madeline goes first. I'll take wine two. 
Tim will take three and four. I'll come back for five. And then Madden, Madeline will back clean up and do wine six. I am pleased that myself, Evan Goldstein, and uh, Tim Gazer, Madeline Trefon, fellow master sommeliers, the three musketeers, if you will, are doing this as we always have. And without further ado, Madeline, I'm going to hand off wine one to you. Cheers, uh, fellow master sommeliers and dear friends, which he actually takes uh, precedence and uh, tasting with these two gentlemen is my idea of the best possible time and tasting with you. By the way, um, a gentle reminder, um, one look at the labels worth a thousand bucks. What I mean by that is when we put the polls up, encourage you to, um, to uh, deduct what you think it might be, please speak up. You know, the, the polls are um, anonymous and it's very helpful to everyone else uh, to see, you know, how many people voted for what. And if you don't think it, it's any of the options, put other. And if you know, then take a deep breath and put what you think it is in the chat room. So cheers to everyone from freezing Detroit, <laughs> but it's sunshiny. So wine number one, I like to remind us all that we can't forget about uh, the visual. And this is um, uh, brilliant, um, very bright, shiny, I would say um, actually pale yellow uh, with a little bit of a green glint. And um, in terms of how it moves in the glass, it's got a little weight viscosity to it. Um, we're not gonna worry about highlights other than green. Sometimes people get into silver, et cetera, but the green con connotes um, youth. And aromatically, this wine immediately jumps up at me with um, three or four elements. The one that is the pushiest is this beautiful ripe tree fruit um, and followed immediately by sweet citrus. And right on the backside of that, uh, fresh flowers like citrus blossoms. And on the backside of that, uh, a subtle but distinct minerality. So the aromatics are clear, easy to perceive. We don't have to fight for them. Yay, thank you, wine. So going back to it a minute, and I think I'm going to describe um, the aroma before I go to the palate. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I take them, you know, together. But let's talk about the, um, the ripe tree fruit. I mean, both green and uh, bosque pear, uh, golden apple, really beautiful tree fruit, a little bit of stone fruit underneath there, like the freshest apricot. There's nothing um, jammy or overdone in the aromatics. They're like picking fruit when it's exactly correct. Sweet citrus. So it took me a while because I didn't grow up with them, but Meyer lemon, right? Maybe a little bit of uh, tangerine. And then um, the florality is expressed through lemon and lime blossom super fresh, maybe a little honeysuckle. It's not a dominant floral, but it's distinct. So hold that thought because florality in your deduction can torque you in one direction or another. And just a reminder, we're not uh, desperate enough to decide what it is by the way it smells, right? Um, the minerality is coming across like um, wet rocks, absolutely no evident of, uh, evidence of oak on the nose super fresh, it's youth is showing, but in a beautiful way, there's actually a lazy smell uh, on the nose. So that may give us a hint of richness to come. Let's go ahead and take it on the palate. Madeline, what gives you, when you describe a wine as being lazy, um, what are some of the markers that people can look for? Because it's a very common wine term. And those of us who are doing it all the time, we know it, but what are the, what are what, what triggers you to say that? You know, yeasty, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, a little doughy or maybe bready, not in exactly the same way as champagne, but maybe a whisper of that. And I commonly don't talk about it. Actually, it's great you bring it up till I get to the palate because what supersedes um, the uh, aromatic expression of it is the way it makes wine feel. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, whoa, my first attack had surprising acidity. So I'm going to take Another sip immediately. I often do that if it's the first wine. With all that lush, open fruit and um, flowers, the acidity came as a surprise to me. It is, and you'll notice up here, questions to consider if you want your mind to 
chew on something. I'm asking you to quantify. You could say or qualify the acid, but when I say quantify, I don't mean one, two, three, four. I mean medium, medium plus, you know, high to get into that habit of being um, not fuzzy, but distinct about um, measuring to your perception, structural elements. This is medium plus plus to me, verging on high acidity. It is cleansing. There's a little bit of a phenolic mouthfeel. It's not dominant, but it's in there. Um, the attack of fruit um, mirrors what I smelled. It's just in a slightly more, um, uh, you know, severe uh, portrait. Uh, so we have ripe, tree fruit, we've got ripe um, sweet citrus and sour citrus as well, like true lime and lemon. We've got um, uh, that subtle floral element on the palate as well. There's also a little bit of spice, like ginger, mm -hmm. um, sesame candy without the sweetness. There's the flavor of leaves, but also the evidence of leaves in the mouthfeel. Absolutely no evidence of oak, not even older barrels, but um, there's a richness um, a fatness to the wine that I think is a combination of uh, least contact, but also possibly, probably old vines. The finish is long. Um, and what else to say about this? The So the aromatics and the flavors mirror one another, but the structure of um, the acidity is a little bit of a surprise. This My wine is not terribly cold because I forgot to over chill it. <laughs> you know, I didn't just pull it out of the fridge. And it's showing like an angel. There's a little bit of um, a nuttiness to it that I think is um, uh, an expression of not oxidation per se, but development. So this is a young wine, but it wasn't born yesterday and it has um, terrific promise. It is what I would call, uh, if I had to put my finger on, you know, non-aromatic, semi-aromatic, highly aromatic, I would say semi-aromatic. Um, you know, meaning that it may or may not be a grape variety that trumpets its um, identity um, with regularity. Um, and the minerality, by the way, I almost forgot about that, absolutely follows through on the palate. I did not, um, uh, I quantified the, uh, the acidity as medium plus verging on high. The alcohol is medium. Um, I, it doesn't command my attention at all. I don't even feel it in my chest. Maybe, uh, and I haven't looked at the number. I like to just see how it works with the balance of the wine. I mentioned um, that little bit of uh, phenolic bitterness, very pleasant, works very well. But, you know, if I have to snapshot the mouthfeel, I would call it um, tart but rich, uh, long finish. Some complexity, particularly on the nose, and is going to develop more complexity as it uh, ages. Beautiful wine. All right. Onwards to the polls. For those of you who are new to us, um, we always have a poll, which you can actually vote for. We give you a couple of choices of grape variety or varieties, if it's marked blend, and then regions of the world. So here you have it, as Madeline said earlier, it is anonymous. So please mm -hmm. vote, please participate, please mm -hmm. engage. Number one, obviously it's great to see how you do versus what it is, but it's also important for us to see what you're thinking as a group so we can address that. So Maddie, what do we got here for choices? Uh, and one quick PS while they're looking mm -hmm. at the choices, you will notice if you take the wine back on your palate and hold it, this is a personal trick that it took me decades to develop. You get a sense of the quality of the fruit and there's an illusion of sweetness, not actual RS that speaks to the concentration of fruit in this wine. So uh, Chenin Blanc, Gruner Veltliner, Groovy and Pinot Gris Grigio. Uh, so Chenin, Actually, Chenin and Gruner with regularity are referred to as semi-aromatic and Pinot Gris Grigio is often referred to as, you know, neutral. Non-aromatic sounds like, you know, a dig. It's not. I would say um, Gruner is going to have a telltale savory quality to it um, with rare exception, whether you want to call it lentil or celery or what you want to, or radish. Those are the terms that come up with regularity, and you may be perceiving it in this wine. Um, a Chenin, let's say classic Chenin from uh, the Loire. Uh, if it's in this glass and it's expressed dry, will have absolutely florality, poignant acidity, right? 
And uh, some other elements that some people describe as wet wool or wax, um, you know, depending on uh, whether it's got botrytis in it or not. But, you know, again, a dry expression, possibly seven year. And Pinot Gris Grigio, if it's Pinot Gris from Alsace, it's going to have what? A fat mouthfeel. Uh, and it may have a little bit of a copper tinge as well, just to remind us all, uh, this grape variety is a thin red grape, which is rarely made by the use of skin contact, like uh, in the way uh, that's called in um, Italy, Ramato, where it picks up a copper tinge. And Grigio, huh, that can be like saying Chardonnay, meaning it can be absolutely um, simple to the point of annoying or very complex. And the regions, we've got Austria, obviously, for Gruner, Italy, um, for uh, Pinot Grigio, no France option for... Um, for European uh, Pinot Gris here, but we've got Oregon as an expression of the new world. Uh, you know, it's not that, it, you know, it's not, Oregon Pinot Gris is out there and we should know how to appreciate it and even identify it in South Africa for Chenin. So we're not being given France as an option for um, Chenin. Quality South African Chenin Blanc can be stunning uh, is usually if not always dry so great 82 percent of the people are in so far good our, yay our good pushed work so so uh, let's see what the results are and uh, we can take it from there so it looks like lion's share of the people or half the people anyway mm -hmm. are in Shen in uh, pinot grigio land a couple in shannon land a couple in gruner and a few in other if your other people want to say what they think in the chat oh please i would love to know i would not be surprised if people put albarillo in there because mm -hmm. we talked about mm -hmm. uh flowers quite a bit and mm -hmm. that's why i mentioned that little be careful um in taking one element to draw your conclusion i'm not saying it isn't albarillo i'm just saying you know it isn't one guy that's going to drive this uh bus it's a team absolutely and okay. it looks like the lines you add up the two at the top it looks like about 50 50 split Old world and know, that's new very world. Interesting. Hmm. Um, any any thoughts there, Madeline? As we close the poll, you know, I mean, to me, it, it had distinct minerality, you know, and that is. Um, I wish I could come up with another term other than inorganic minerality, which just is is so unromantic. But you mm -hmm. know, whether you want to call it salinity or sea spray or wet rocks, this baby's got it. Um, both aromatically and on the palate. It's very distinct to me. Um, not to say that New World expressions, especially Oregon in this case, or Old Vine South Africa can't show some of that rocky quality. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it would be this distinct, possibly from Old Vines, yes. So, All right, let's hop on that plane and see oh, where it yes, goes. Oh, yes, I forget. I always get the I.L. Seaton business class. These guys <laughs> just get economy upgrades. You know? and, and let it be known that, that Silka behind the scenes here is the person who generates all of these flyovers mm -hmm. uh, for us using Google Earth. And we're always appreciative of the effort put into it and the uh, accuracy that's there. Looks like you're on a long plane We're flight, on a Madeline. long trip. We are leaving the United States. So it ain't Oregon. We're not going down to South Africa. We're in Europe. AKA the old world. I'm still going to use that phrase because I like it. We're in Northeastern Italy. We are in uh, the Alto Adige. We are, you know, we're just south of the Austrian Alps. We are um, at uh, one of the best co-ops on the planet, Cantina Tramen, which has well over 150 families. Uh, they say families and then they say 300 growers. So there you have it. I mean, it's... Um, um, a co-op that really uh, screams quality, both at its, you know, entry level accessible, accessible uh, wines like this. This is mm -hmm. their um, Pinot Grigio, yeah, currently 2022. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I'm going to keep okay. talking. Is that all right? All right. Sure. Um, but it really shows the nobility of fine European uh, cooperative wineries, much like um, the... Um, the Nebbiolo Co-op, Produttori del Barbaresco. This was uh, founded in the eight, late 1800s, in this case, by a priest um, to help protect the livelihood of the, um, the families. And it has grown big time and even merged with another co-op. It's funny to me, we say Trentino Alto Adige, like it's saying, you know, 
Michigan and Ohio, but they're very different, you know. Um, Maddie, also, I was going to say Daily City in San Francisco for well, us. There you go. <laughs> or Berkeley in San Francisco. Um, Alto IDJ, you know, we're talking altitudes for this particular co-op that soar to Mendoza levels, like up to 2,500 feet above sea level. The uh, Pinot Grigio, this particular grape is grown on vineyards that are um, pushing to, uh, you know, they're over 1,200 feet above uh, sea level. They are on uh, calcareous uh, clay soil. Sound familiar for, you know, Chardonnay, right? Um, so uh, high calcium content, it is um, uh, fermented and stainless. It goes through partial mallow, just to give you a, a little bit of uh, winery uh, background in terms of how they handle their fruit. Um, they really monitor and micromanage, meaning help all the growers very specifically on their plot. So that's how they can make a wine uh, at, you know, relatively commercial production levels uh, so good. Uh, something, just a couple things more about Alto IDJ. This is another area in the world that um, really benefits from uh, diurnal swings. Uh, of temp, but also really neat influences of uh, cold winds coming down from uh, the Austrian Alps and warm winds coming up from um, Lake Garda. Uh, you know, terrific diversity in aspects, slopes, and soils, um, and stunning beauty. I strongly uh, suggest that you go online and look at the uh, modern, almost shocking um, architecture of the winery, but also the countryside. Um, you guys want to pipe up about anything else? Yeah, no, I love that. You get a little kiss of that architecture on the right-hand mm -hmm. side of the, the mm -hmm. photo there overlooking the vineyards. I think it's a, a couple of thoughts. And then, Madeline, if you can maybe address the why Pinot Grigio, as opposed to say Chenin Blanc or some of the other sure. varieties that we had. But um, I, I think it's a great example of why we shouldn't, you know, sort of roll our eyes when we hear cooperatives. I think you did a very good job articulating how um, the quality of co-ops has been, frankly, they're, they've been pushed by small estates, which have really shown that, you know, you make a better opportunity if you can focus on quality and not just volume and stuff like that. Because if you don't, the producers who make really good fruit who are selling to the co-ops eventually leave and go off and do their own thing too. So it's been a really wonderful, and I agree with you, Traman does a, a terrific job there. Um, I am ready to address the whole business about why Pinot Grigio, is that okay with you? Go for it, yeah. And by the way, you know, I mean, you know, Pinot Grigio came evidently through the Piedmont to, you know, throughout Northern Italy some time ago. Um, Friuli brags that it does the best job, but frankly, aromatically, I think it's very hard to beat Alto Adige, you know? <laughs> And yes, there are, there's oodles of it produced uh, in a, um, you know, blithely commercial uh, way in um, the Veneto. But, you know, if I think of it as um, a grape variety and how it expresses it in this glass, remember the first thing I said, just that beautiful expression of tree fruit, apples and pears um, of all kinds, which it shares with Chardonnay. I often wrestle in blind tastings between Chardonnay and um, Pinot, Gris, Pinot Grigio, unless it's Alsace, which is really a different animal altogether. And also the quality and um, the quality of the acidity. So it did throw my head back a bit, but it doesn't have the piercing character of um, Chenin's acidity. It also lacks the uh, more veering towards stone fruit, peach, apricot, both um, dried and fresh. And also Chenin's hard to put your finger on smell of, I say wet will, because I used to wash, um, you know, cashmere sweaters when one could afford them. Um, and groovy, because it doesn't have a uh, little checklist of savory elements, like, you know, um, root vegetables and such. So that would be my, uh, my short, simple, but I think um, correct answer to that question. Unless Tim, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, Maddie, those are great thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. What I will say is the wet wool is sulfur compounds mm -hmm. of some kind. Um, I think, generally speaking, Shannon is going to be riper, could be botrytis. The acid, of course, is going to be high. Pinot Grigio, to me, especially from Alto Adige, and I agree with you there, 
is that the best wines are made in Alto Adige, Pinot Grigio. They're not uh, certainly not Trentino, and they're not freely by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and that's mainly because practically all the the vineyards are on steep hillsides, and so you've got low vine low yields, and you've got handcrafted on and on and on. Erica, okay. what we said earlier, you know, uh, concentration of fruit, if not from yep. old vines, from low yields. And also in the Alto Adige, I think those floral aromatics will be punched up. Yep. Um, yeah, a little bit, but they're not going to be, you know, Albarino or fully aromatic, right? right? It's delicious. Um, I'm drinking this wine. Yeah, <laughs> to me, you know, Alto Adige, Pinot Grigio, it smells like green pears and pear skin, mm -hmm. also some mm -hmm. citrus, some mineral, a little bit of phenolic bitterness, and a really a touch of floral. So it's kind of like a whole package, but very That's what restrained. I said, yay. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Excellent. I looked up the picture in your book, I mean, the, the page in your book, just to see if I agreed. <laughs> Tim's book. <laughs> Message You're welcome. The bottle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and as we move to wine number two now, I just that's a stunning uh, picture, that last one, and sort of very mm -hmm. classic vineyard shot of the region. All right, I'm going to take on wine number two as a standard operating procedure when we're all in, in town at the same time. Uh, as always, we take a look at uh, against a white background, as Madeline discussed earlier. And I always look at what I call the shallow end and the deep end of the pool to see if there's any difference. We don't talk about it much with white wines, but when you get to reds, the greater the differentiation between in the middle of the glass and the edge of the glass, um, the older the wine generally is, the more the more shading variations as opposed to just being one consistent color or one color and then a, a rim color as well. This is a nice uh, shade. My room's a little bit dark, but it's got a bit more color than the first wine that Madeline had. So maybe more of a deeper, uh, deeper straw color, a little bit more intensity. Uh, a little bit more volume of color. Not a lot of sheeting or tearing there. So again, right off the top, I wouldn't be necessarily expecting a, a high alcohol, big wine. And um, lastly, uh, a little bit also, again, of that sort of same kind of green tinge in the background, which either connotes, as Madeline said before, youth or perhaps cooler climate or some combination of both, right? So uh, that's really it. I move on. I want to make sure there's nobody doing the backstroke in my glass, which there isn't, or any funky stuff floating around there, and it doesn't look like milk. So uh, make sure it's sound. And we move on to the most important thing, which is, of course, the aromatics and ultimately flavor before we measure the structure. I always look for a few things, F, E, W, fruit, earth, wood, and then a few players to be named later. And if I cover that, first of all, it's great conversation at the dinner table, but I know I'm also sort of exhausting the personality of the wine. So right off the bat, as I smell this wine, um, I too, like uh, Madeline's wine, I'm, I'm hit with sort of a citrus element, but a riper, a rounder citrus element. So while you do have some you know, lemony and, and sharp characters in there, it's really dominated by a rounder riper. So the citrus that's there is a ripe citrus uh, that's there. There is tree fruit in the wine. I would put it in sort of that apple-y vein of things or pear, maybe sort of on the uh, ripe side, sort of just ripe, not overripe, not juicy ripe, but not underripe either. And um, I'm getting that, I'm getting some uh, apples, sort of yellow to green, maybe a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of a quince type character there. There's definitely some floral notes to it as well, more in that sort of citrus blossom, apple blossom thing. And then once again, uh, some stone fruits. Stone fruits here being more sort of nectarine, peach, yellow plum. Again, everything ripe, not overripe, not underripe. In the world of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, just right. Everything looks beautifully <laughs> there. I am getting, um, uh, again, sort of a mineral uh, type element to it. It's actually uh, pronouncing itself both on the the, the side of the uh, non-earth things, almost like an olive brine character. Like for those of you who don't rinse your, your olives, I like a, a dirty martini. I like when it's a little briny. I like to use the olive brine in my cooking as well too, but also sort of a, a slightly saline thing. There is a gingery character to it, more fresh than it is dried. And again, sort of a soft um, kind of a, a stoniness to it. You could either put a stone, you could argue it's sort of limestone chalky and maybe even almost a little bit plenty, but it's really pronounced and the more air you get into this glass, the more it jumps up and pops up and the fruit character subdues backwards there. In the palette, oh, by the way, anything else there? Uh, herbal, yeah, soft, maybe a little bit of sorrel, kind of picking up on that green element there. Maybe a touch of uh, verbena or something like that. Not anything what I would call super green green. So it's not obviously a green variety, um, nor is it green from uh, being herbal or green from being under in that regard. In the mouth, Now that my palate has been well seasoned by that delicious Traum and Pinot Grigio, 
I'm going to go in and get it on one thing there. Uh, first of all, right off the bat, I noticed sort of a grip and a pull. You could argue that it's a little bit phenolic, but I'm not getting any of the bitter elements. What I'm really getting is that sort of grittiness, which I call minerality. Minerality is at once um, smelled, it's tasted, but it's also felt. And for those of you who were who lived in a time before smart boards and things like that, when we had chalks and erasers, if you clopped the erasers together and the chalk dust got into the air and ultimately into your mouth and you got that film, that's what I'm getting here. So there is a sort of grit or grip uh, to the wine, uh, sort of in a very soft vein, which I would call distinctive minerality, again, felt as well as smelled and tasted. The wine is at once got some roundness to it but still with a nice sort of lean structure to it, similar in the way that Madeline's wine came off to you there. But there's also sort of a softness there. There's a plushness uh, to the palate, which makes me start thinking varietally what it could be. And then it goes on. It's got a nice medium plus finish. Uh, it's got nice medium plus acid. It's got probably a moderate level of alcohol. My chest isn't burning up like a, a jack-o'-lantern here. And it's sort of slightly expansive, which is to say, not only does the finish go, but the, it's like a peacock's tail, it kind of unravels a little bit. Does a peacock's tail unravel or unfolds? Whatever they do as the time goes by. Um, it's a delicious wine. It's a wine that doesn't come off to me as per se the most complex wine in the world. But I think for what it is, when we learn about it later, it's a really, really solid It example. fans out. It fans out. There you go. Peacock's tails fan. Uh, again, take a look at the questions. As, Ma as Madeline said, we always like to throw out a few things there to consider. And uh, dry or fruity? Is it floral? What kind of fruit is it? A little bit earthy. And then the texture. So all the things we sort of did. And as I said before, does it have grit? Uh, true grit? John Wayne? Yes, I think we do. All right. So let's take a look at what our choices are and throw up the poll there. Uh, as always, we have three uh, great choices. In this case, it might be Chardonnay. And if you think about your um, examples of Chardonnay that you've had, Chardonnay is a global grape that can uh, interpret itself in many ways. Oftentimes, uh, a vineyard or the fruit can then sort of put itself out there. And then the winemaker, it's really the winemaker's wine, can decide whether it's through oak or lees stirring or the use of, uh, of uh, oak barrels, whatever it is, what they want to do. But it does have sort of a nice intrinsic character and a, and a softness to it. Albarino and Alvarino, we spoke about before. Albarino being on the Spanish side, up in Galicia and the Rias Baixas. Alvarino being on the Minho side, just on the southern side of the river in Portugal. Um, they too have a nice sort of stony, uh, sharp fruit thing there. They tend to be kind of um, leaner in the Portuguese side, a little bit more um, plush on the Spanish side, but both of them very linear, very bright acid levels. Uh, when they're done and always sort of reeking of both florality and usually stone fruits. Sauvignon Blanc and a blend. Uh, so in that particular case, Sauvignon Blanc could be the dominant grape when blended with other players. But this thing to me, one, doesn't come off as a blend. It speaks very much from a singular voice, a soloist versus a choir. And there's just really, I mean, ask yourself how much greenness in there is there then when we talk about Sauvignon Blanc. Regions, you have France, going with your Chardonnay and your Sauvignon. You have Spain going with your, uh, obviously your Al Albarino and perhaps your Sauvignon too, if you're in Catalonia. Oregon can be all three flavors, uh, probably led by uh, by Chardonnay and maybe a little bit of Albarino in the South. And then Australia, which does everything there. So think about uh, what it could be and how those different grapes manifest themselves. Once again, think about not only the descriptors that I threw out there, but your own as you're going through it. It's really important to note that we are not God uh, out here. And it's important that you develop your own palate. You come up with your own lexicon of terminology, which over time will grow with your experience and frequency in uh, trying a lot of uh, different varieties. So I'm hopeful that most people have got their votes in. And let's go ahead and... Um, Throw up, throw up, throw out that poll. What's interesting here is we seem to have almost a split of people who are in the Chardonnay land and the Albarino, Alvarino land, not so much on Sauvignon Blanc and a couple of person, person who wants to say other, feel free to jump in. It looks like the correlation of the geography, certainly the lion's share of people do believe that it's an older world European wine and the numbers seem to play that out. Australia is always a good bet elsewhere. Chardonnay versus Albarino or Alvarino. The only thing that I would add to you is Chardonnay always has sort of a richness and texture and more of a neutrality. Albarino and Alvarino to me always seem a little bit not only more shrill in nature, but more pronounced in their 
aromatics there. And I'm not getting quite enough of that there for me personally to see it. But as we close the poll and we hop on the plane, let's see where we're going. So let's hop on that plane. Let's leave Italy and um, and move around. That, that Cantina Tramon is really an awesome place. And that part of the world is spectacularly good, not just for wine, but for food as well too. North Northeastern Italy is wonderful. But we're getting on there and we're going to move around. This is a uh, I wouldn't call it a Ryanair flight, but it's a short flight. And um, we are going to take the benefit of that to just have a quick mm -hmm. little snack, but we're hopping next door. We're going over to France and we're landing down in Burgundy. We're landing down in the Southern part of Burgundy, just before you hit Beaujolais in the area that they call the Maconnais, which is becoming more and more popular in this day and age as scarcity, um, is increasing and prices and price. are increasing in the Cote d'Or of Burgundy. And a lot of people who make wine in the Cote d'Or are venturing further south and the overall quality of wines are moving south here. So where are we? We are in the community and the commune of the Maconnais and specifically in the commune of saint varin So saint varin is in the southern, southern, southern. So if I'm looking there on my map, my eyesight isn't really good. I'm going all the way bottom down there right before I hit Beaujolais to saint varin Now saint varin became recently popular when the first of wines that sort of put the Maconnais on the map were Macon and of course Macon Village, right? The Macon Villages wine you see everywhere. And then of course Puy, uh, and it's Puy Fuisse, Puy Vanzel, et cetera. Puy being a, a major thing there. Puy went through um, a, a big day of reckoning after it became popular, it became overcropped, and the wines were really uninteresting. And then came San Varan. San Varan came in, filled in the gap, still predictably super high quality and doing a good job. And what's interesting there is that it is literally the farthest south you can get in Burgundy. And the next stop is Beaujolais. And in fact, it actually intersects in the crew of Saint Amour. And here's a little factoid, white wines that are produced in Saint Amour are actually labeled Saint Varin. Who knew? But it's actually a very cool little factoid there. And they do Venn specifically there. I love Saint Varin for its consistency. I love Saint Varin for the quality of, uh, of what you get for the money, and that it really speaks to Chardonnay and speaks to me of what I remember of the best of Puy Fuisse and the best of Macon Village when it hits right. It is dominated not only by nice fruit character, but by what they call locally the so-called so Pierre à Fouzi, right? Pierre, like spelled Pierre, meaning stone, and à Fouzi meaning gun, so gun stone or gun flint being sort of the classic area, but whether you call it gunflint, being very specific, mineral, stone, even chalk, all those things kind of work together. There is always a defining um, inorganic uh, earth character to it. This particular wine is cool. If we move to the next slide, and it's simply labeled as saint Perrin Les Pierres Gris. So in this case, the gray stones. And um, it's just a delightful, delightful example of it. Uh, at a very good value. San Ferrans are often good values. As Burgundy, as Madeline said before, becomes increasingly unaffordable. It's great to have a wine like this. Now, if you're looking for your sort of caramelly, deftly, butterscotched and slightly toffee example, this ain't it. But this is such a great example of what pure, unadulterated Burgundian Chardonnay from the Maconnais tastes like. It hits on, on all cylinders. This is a wine that is a negociant wine. Now, let me take an opportunity to explain what that means. A negociant means, and this is the beautiful, beautiful shot. Uh, yeah, yeah San Varan is gorgeous. And what I love there is it, it, it looks at once like antiquated, but kind of semi-modern at the same time too. It's very small. You can properly walk from one side to the other um, pretty quickly. And then obviously there are vineyards, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, surrounding the town. Um, in sort of working their way downwards there. This is a negociant wine, which is to say there's not one particular winery that's involved. In fact, the winery is not even divulged on the label or there, but it's 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 a wine that is bought and made uh, by an importer in this particular case, in this case by the Skernick Brothers, uh, Skernick Wine Imports. They're based in Manhattan. That's Michael Skernick on the left-hand side. I'll tell you a story about him in a minute and his brother Harmon on the left-hand side. And they are not only leading importers of awesome wines from literally all over the world, um, literally curating, finding, and bringing over there, they have a few wines which are their own. 
And this is a wine which being a negociant, they have contracted with a winery to actually produce a genre of wine that they work together to come up with the palate profile they want. And then they bring it over uh, as a San Varan under their label of, in this case, the Grey Stones, Ole Pierre Gris. Mm -hmm. So um, anytime I see uh, an importer, importers are a good way if you're not familiar with the wine, look at who the importer is. And if it's a good importer, a la Skernik, you can generally be pretty assured that the quality level of the wine is going to not only meet your expectations, but oftentimes supersede them. Michael May I Skernick, jump in on that? Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. No, I'll we tell my Michael Skernik story that. afterwards. Go ahead. I Nani. was simply going to say, you know, um, it's really important either as a, well, you, you, it becomes obvious to you as a buyer, but, you know, especially as a consumer, though, to flip the bottles around. And if you start peeling and revealing, you know, the importers are right there front and center to pay attention to the importers. Because Skernik is a big mark of quality in terms of a smaller, um, you know, importer as opposed to Mongo size, much like Kermit Lynch. And if they put out a Skernik selection or a Kermit Lynch selection, uh, it means something. It's not lesser. And I've got to say, this is a a great value in a white burgundy that is not Chablis, you mm -hmm. know, and has a little bit of the richness of um, um, of the Cote de Bonne, I encourage you to actually play with your wine one and two during this, after this, after the reds, because that, that's really one of the, um, isn't it one of the evil dwarves uh, combo, Tim, where, you know, <laughs> Chardonnay and uh, Pinot Grigio, mm -hmm. yep. you know. Yep. Which one is it? So yeah, that's my absolutely. 10 cents. And I ripped away your Skernick story. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. I was just going to say, Michael and I go back decades when he was actually repping Montmessin Beaujolais and selling that and um, playing in a band called the Wynettes along with Josh Wesson and Kevin Israeli and all that. We became dear friends there and I watched him grow into the business. He's a rock and roller, as you can see by his hair there. A tremendous palette, a really good guy. And a, and good, a good website. Friend. Yeah, yeah. And a very website. informative website mm -hmm. as well, too. So uh, some good stuff there. Are there any um, questions that uh, we should be aware of in the chat? Anything that um, we're addressing well, here, guys? Yeah, well, Jerry's uh, asking a question about vintage. And and Jerry, you know, for the purposes of what we're doing, we, we narrow the vintage choices down to about two years, unless it's a really old red wine, in which case, you know, the range of years that we present is broader. But for the in all intents and purposes for white wines, one or two vintages is good because once you get beyond three, you'll see noticeable differences in the color and certainly oxidative notes in the wine. But that's a really good question. Yeah. And this wine, of course, is showing super duper fresh. And as Madeline pointed out, a wonderful textural example, a great uh, example of uh, of a Macquanet wine, a Southern Macquanet wine and uh, San Varan, one of my personal favorites. So great. With that, Tim, let's hand it over to you and you've got wine three. OK, thanks, Evan. Uh, a couple quick notes before we go on. First of all, can we just say Imgo Blue and congrats to Michigan <laughs> for winning the national championship? Yeah. Uh, second of all, those of you that are looking at my screen and wondering, uh, you know, that's a really scenic view, Tim. What's with a ceiling fan? Uh, <laughs> technology is great only when it works. And I went to plug, unplug my backup hard drive and plug my video cam in, and it failed right before we went on. So we're using the camera that's on the laptop, hence why I seem small. And if I turn to the monitor, which is about three times of what I'm looking at, and I'm not looking at my gorgeous profile, which kind of looks like an aging Norman Bates, but I'm looking at bigger. No way. That's easier to read. Okay, with that, we are on to wine number three. And now for something completely different, as they say on TV. So let's take a look at it first as you tilt your glass forward over a white background, like Lee Bang always has you do. The wine is clear, right? It is really quite bright, reflects a lot of light. And uh, we're going to call the depth of color medium and its straw versus yellow compared to wine number two. And in terms of legs, viscosity, uh, Marangoni and all that, it is a solid medium. So everything sets up pretty quickly and the tears, legs are medium and they move pretty quickly. All right, on to the nose. And as you smell the wine, just take a few seconds and appreciate the fact that there's a lot going on here. It's a pretty complex nose. It's a veritable cornucopia of different fruit. In fact, it's got, I think, at least four out of the five fruit groups, right? So starting with uh, some citrus fruit, and it's predominantly sweet citrus. So it's like things like Meyer lemon and mandarin and uh, 
maybe a little bit of key lime, sweet lime, and the condition is fresh and tart and ripe. In terms of tree fruit, which is apple and pear, fancy talk, here it's not green, so it, it's riper. It's like uh, yellow apple, it's brown pear, maybe Asian pear, and uh, again, fresh and ripe. There's also some tropical fruit here. I'd say it's pineapple predominantly, again, ripe. And finally, there's, there's uh, stone fruit, pit fruit. So there's peach, which I would describe as yellow, uh, nectarine, which I would describe as white, and maybe apricot, and fresh and ripe. So there's a lot of different fruit groups. And to me, I always get, you know, suspicious. If, it, if it's a single grape variety versus it's a blend, and this is the first time I'm having suspicions, uh, what else is floral? Because there's not only honey, there's honeysuckle and maybe jasmine, so white flowers. What else? Um, maybe a little vegetative element like spring peas. There's also verbena because there's lemony and herbal, very high toned. And what else? There's a little spiciness, ginger. And beyond that, maybe a little green tea. Earth and mineral. Uh, both very minor players. There's a little uh, wet stone, you know, rain on sidewalk kind of thing going on. And maybe a touch of turn soil. But really, I mean, fruit is the predominant player here, along with some floral. Uh, I think there could be some used oak. There's a very light nuttiness, kind of walnutty and almond, maybe marzipan. And a little oxidation. And if anything, there's, uh, and that oxidation also reminds me of least contact. So let's taste it and find out. Please do. Right. Wow. All right. So, you know, what's interesting is the wine smells richer than it is on the palate, right? So I'm going to go to the structure first and work backwards because the acid is higher than I thought it would be. So the acid is medium plus, almost medium plus plus. The alcohol is medium. It's restrained. It's 13% at best, right? There is a touch of phenolic bitterness, and I'm not surprised given that the floral qualities were in the wine. In fact, if you connect those two dots, you should connect. It's just like the Pinot Grigio with wine one, right? You got florals, odds are you've got phenolic bitterness and skin contact. Okay, what else? Um, the texture I would describe as round and smooth, but and that's the way it starts, and then it finishes bright and tart. Okay, in terms of confirming everything, everything from the fruit is there. So the the sweet citrus, the mandarin, uh, key lime, Meyer lemon, it's all there. Little tartar, uh, apple also a little tartar. Maybe Fuji versus yellow, and uh, maybe a little green pear versus brown. Tropical fruit, pineapple, definitely there. Pineapple being very acidic. And then um, the stone fruit, more white than yellow, but it's still fairly rich. Mineral is there, earthiness, no. But again, mineral, it's a, it's a bit player here. And I keep mentioning that because I'm trying to get you to examine, you know, general place-wise where the wine could be from in terms of location. Uh, the oak, once again, is used, probably, you know, multiple use barrels, uh, the finish is medium plus. I think the wine is really quite complex. Okay. Now, we didn't talk about my questions, but having told you all those things. So, yes, was oak used in the production? I think so. Yeah, it's used oak. What are the non? What are the most important non-fruit type aromas? Well, there's really not a lot of them. There's the floral qualities. Um, there's very light herbal qualities. And uh, what else? That's And then we've got probably least contact and uh, some used oak, right? And some phenolic bitterness too. So how does the wine structure reflect the climate? Well, everybody, we've got, again, restrained alcohol, higher acidity, uh, a little bit of phenolic bitterness. And yeah, so we're not talking about a really warm climate. So let's go to the poll, Silka, and see what we have. So we've got Sauvignon Blanc. We've got a Rhone blend, which is white, of course. And we've got Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, which we're going to rule out because we just had one. <laughs> All right. So oh, Evan's done it before, though. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. I was. I shouldn't have said that, Evan. Right? You know, because it. You know, it has happened. Historically. Oh, it has happened. Okay. All right. So we've got Old World Italy, Old World France, New World Australia, and New World California. Okay. So everybody, why don't you place your votes? See what uh, we Ken, have. May I make a comment about the? the mouthfeel of the wine. 
Sure. Uh, as a PS to, you know, you're perceiving uh, higher acidity than you expected, but still there is a moving more into the sort of non-quantifiable poetic zone. There's an, a lush openness to this wine mm. um, that's, uh, and I think in that respect, the complexity of the fruit comes through. It's delish, you know, it's easy um, to drink. And I think the finish is, is long. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Jerry, you know, you're doubling back on your vintage question. I would just say, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, that vintage for a conclusion is not hugely important. You know, some people may disagree with me. And, you know, you know, with white wines, you're going to get a range of one, two or three years and that's it. Okay. And uh, red wines is different. Red wines, judging by the color and the oxidative quality of the wines, the age is more important that you gauge it. Is the wine three years old or younger, three to five, five and beyond? Yeah, good questions. Okay, so what do we have? The envelope, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Scott, uh, we're going to talk to you in just a second. So we have 20% voting for Sauvignon Blanc. 60% voting Rhone Blend, and then nobody voting for Pinot Gris. And then uh, we've got France. Okay, so everybody, I think I made it a point to say the wine ain't very minerally or earthy. Mm, hint, okay? So uh, let, let me see, because I, I have to scroll down. I have to go over here. So you have to look at my fabulous profile. There we, we go. We had a significant so, other, too. Was part of that, Shannon? Because somebody asked the question, yeah, maybe why so. not Shannon? So, Okay, so let's uh, reveal what it is, and then we're going to talk about why it's not the other things. Okay. All right. Let's. So, so we're going to hop on our plane. Uh no. Okay. No. Let's, let's just go reveal ahead. what it is. Okay. So everybody, I'm going to go back up because uh, again, I'm going to look over here. All right, Sauvignon Blanc. Those of you the Sauvignon Blanc, my one question to you is: Where are the pyrazines? Does wine smell like green bell pepper, herbs, grass, things like that? No. So Sauvignon Blanc's off the table. Rhone blend, yeah, because think about it. I mentioned the wine really doesn't smell like one thing. It's not strongly monovarietal. It smells like it's got a huge variety of different fruits. It's got a little bit of floral, a little bit of spiciness. Uh, yeah. You know, so it doesn't remind me of any one thing. If I got this in a blind tasting, I would get somewhere close to Rhone just by process of elimination. That it doesn't have botrytis, it doesn't have white pepper, it doesn't have pyrazines, you know, and so it, I would have to get there by process of elimination. So those of you that went to others, so Scott wanted to know, Shannon Blanc, K, as we say in New Mexico, why not? So Scott, the only thing I would say about that is that uh, there's not enough there there. So there's, you know, certainly the, the huge range of fruit reminds me of Chenin Blanc. The acid for Chenin Blanc is, should be higher. There should be a more pronounced mineral quality and usually a sign of sulfur. People call it wet wool or lanolin or something mm -hmm. like that. And more floral qualities. There's just more of everything. Um, and maybe a little bit of botrytis too, and possibly residual sugar. Okay. Uh, what else I'm reading? You went from Muscadet from the Loire when I tasted this the other day. Okay. Uh, and that is Akeem. So Akeem, the only thing I would say is, is Muscadet is fairly neutral stuff. And this is not neutral. It's got so much fruit. Uh, I don't usually think of Muscadet as having a lot of fruit, mineral and acid and uh, lees. Lees is really important to Muscadet. Okay. Okay. All right. Hop on a plane. So now we hop on the uh, Evans, you know, Learjet. Air Evans. Air Evan. Yeah. Although actually I was going to do Air Evan, but I, but apparently the uh, the people in Washington, when they knocked down the Spirit Jet Blue thing, they knocked down the Evan Air program at the same time. <laughs> I won't get on those little planes. They make me feel claustrophobic. All y'all can have them. Uh, yeah. So we're leaving. Goodbye, France. Goodbye, Burgundy. Uh, yeah. Next time. Till next time. Yes. And so we're going to cross the Atlantic. We're going to go all the way across the country and we are going to go to Santa Barbara. Mm. And we are in Santa Barbara and I think near Los Olivos, but this is the margarine uh, wine cellars. And so this is Doug Marjoram. And, and I, you know, I think I've known Doug since mm, early 90s restaurant days. Evan, you too, probably. Yeah, what, back in the days of the wine too. cask. Yeah. yeah, the wine cask. And uh, the wine cask, which is an amazing restaurant. And, and Doug built it into a grand award that I think he got in 94. But anyway, you know, he built a wine futures there. Uh, he had um, a wine label that he did with Jim Clendenin and Bob Lindquist called Vita Nova. And um, 
I mean, he's just done a lot of stuff. Marsham Sellers, though, I think dates from the early 2000s. It's dedicated to uh, Rhone varieties and Rhone blends. Uh, I know he has a long-term lease on an 18-acre vineyard near Los Olivos. Uh, his winery is near Buellton. And his two main wines are just called M5. And obviously M5 uh, modeled after Chateauneuf du Pop in terms of a blend. So it's a Grenache blend for red. And his white wine here, M5, stands for Marsan, Roussan, what else? Grenache Blanc, Pique Poul Blanc, and what am I missing? Viognier, which Viognier accounts for the floral qualities. But again, these are co-fermented and aged in second and third use barrels, hence the used oak. And um, I think this is, you know, truly representative of like a Chateauneuf de Pop Blanc, right? Uh, what it lacks is really a pronounced mineral quality, but also, you know, the warmer climate that you would get in Chateauneuf de Pop is not here. Los Olivos, near the Pacific in Santa Barbara County, you know, long, cool growing seasons. You get grapes that are ripe, but not high in sugar and alcohol, um, the wines. So uh, great stuff. Uh, I think really representative for a Rhone blend from California without all the baby fat. Yeah. But that said, those of you who are about to take a certified exam or an advanced tasting exam, please don't have a panic attack <laughs> that, you know, you've got to have yes. to like nail um, a Santa Barbara um, white Rhone. You know, and no. Evan will tell you that these kits uh, range from classic to outlier to discovery brands to, you know, in between. But, no. you know, the punchline with all the wines that are selected are their quality. Yeah. yeah. My, also, my experience in, in, in Evan, you would probably agree with, you know, Doug's wines is that he's always been about elegance and restraint, mm -hmm. even with Rhone varieties. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think this really speaks to that. Yeah, no, and I and I think it's a wonderful sort of in betweener. You know, I, I thought it was sort of it made me smile, even though obviously the fruit character dominates and any sort of stoniness that's there is in the back thing. But that it has sort of a, a very old world sensibility about it. Uh, obviously, being as you said from Los Olivos and down in the in the Santa Barbara area, it's not going to get as warm as the sort of Bouche de Vent in the area around Avignon and stuff like that, where you're going to get much thicker richer, um, in some cases, almost syrupy rich wines down there. This wine shows restraint, the elegance that you just spoke of, Tim, which is Doug's hallmark there. And while it, it's at once sort of flamboyant in its roniness, it also shows a little bit of uh, stepping back there. All the pieces come together. I love the fact that he does co-ferment everything together. So it really does uh, come together as a nice composite. He doesn't look, he never, the man doesn't age. He's the guy yeah. in the blue shirt there, third from the yeah. right. And um, just just a masterful job and literally seems to pull out a little bit of everything uh, from each of the own wines. And that acid, that acidity speaks, of course, to the to the climate as well, too. And what's wonderful is the wine has the richness. It's clearly ripe, but it has just a little bit more uh, a little bit more uh, precision in its backbone than, say, your your typical uh, southern Rhone wine, unless you're in a place like Chateau. I am channeling Li Mang, who is saying you've got three wines and oh, a little over half an hour. All right. So all right. To... We're going to keep All right. Going. I can dig in. All right. All right. OK. Uh, wine four. Real, That's real quick, Ben Cat. Yeah. Ben Cat says, how come the wine isn't that expressive? And Ben and, and Cat, it's, it's a matter of place and the grapes getting ripe. You got a warmer climate with Marsan, Roussan, or Viognier, and they give you more on the nose and the palate. Okay, wine number four. We'll do the questions. What does the wine depth of color suggest about the possible grape? And the question to you is, is it a thick skin or thinner skin grape? Number two, what are the most important non-fruit aromas and flavors? We'll touch on those in just a second, but you need to decide. And then finally, how would you describe the quality of the tannins and the texture of the wine? All right, going forward. Here we go. Uh, looking at the wine, it is a true medium ruby red in color, very youthful, lightens up to a lighter ruby, maybe even pink, almost fuchsia colored. Um, it is clear I can read through it. What else about it uh, doesn't stay in the glass? Tears, legs, marangoni, etc. is medium plus. All right. And then on the nose, predominantly red fruit. So red cherry, pomegranate, uh, red plum, maybe some cranberry. So ripe and tart, but definitely fresh. There's a little bit of black fruit here, but what black fruit there is, is lifted. It's got acid. So blackberries, black raspberries, and they are fresh and ripe. And then there's a little bit of orange peel, citrus peel. And that really adds lift to it as well. And that's fresh as well. Uh, florals, it's rose, rose petal, really pretty. 
any other vegetable type things. Mm, there's some kind of, kind of like peppers, uh, maybe sun-dried tomatoes. And there's herbs. Mainly it's like tea leaf, but there's also bergamot and maybe a little fresh sage. Okay. In terms of uh, anything else, uh, maybe a little red licorice, earthen mineral, a little turned soil, no mineral. Uh, there's definitely oak aging. And I would say there's moderate use of oak. So there's definitely some, there's vanilla and there's a range of spices. There's cardamom, and there's nutmeg, brown spices, brown spices, okay? Uh, what else? That gives a little oxidative quality to it, like um, like walnut skins or marzipan. And in terms of winemaking, I would say there's definitely some little bit of whole cluster here because there's definitely some stems and we're going to taste those in the moment. So everybody taste it, please. Mm. So as is often the case with red wine, it tartens up on the palate. So practically all red fruit, cranberries, pomegranate, which is not fruit, um, and actually maybe even some rhubarb, which is definitely not fruit. And there's tart and fresh, little little dark fruit. Florals don't, don't come through. Uh, the herbal comes through, the bergamot. What else? Uh, the peppers, yeah. Sun-dried tomatoes, tea leaf, uh, just a touch of earthiness, and the oak now really comes through. It's textural, and there's spices, and there's a little bit of vanilla. In terms of the structure, um, before I move on, there's definitely the the green stemmy quality from uh, stem contact, which again speaks to partial or a whole little cluster. Okay, uh, structure: the wine is ooh medium plus in terms of its acid, alcohol. It's medium plus. I can feel it right about here. Uh, tannin is really, uh, it's moderate, it's smooth, uh, it's very supple. Texture is very smooth, for lack of a better word, and finishes medium plus. Okay, I think about that about describes it. So let's go to our poll, Silka. And here are your choices for the Emmy. Uh, we've got Pinot Noir, we've got Gamay, we've got Grenache Blend, and then your region choices are France, Italy, Oregon, or Australia, which of course makes everything, okay? So everybody take a look and uh, cast your votes and let's see what you think. Yeah, uh, just a quick a, a quick of you as you were dissecting those three choices, Pinot Noir, Gamay, and Grenache, in some respects, there's some similarities between them, yep. which is obviously why they've been selected there. But what would you, what would be a bird dog trait for you in, in each of those three grapes as people are okay. thinking about it? That's a good question, Evan. Oddly enough, the and Madeline mentioned it earlier, these are three of the evil dwarfs for red wines, okay? Because they all can look alike, right? So Pinot Noir, of course, uh, thinner skin grape, you know, uh, supple fruit, soft tannins, uh, a lot of non-fruit potential there. Gamay, of course, classic examples. We think of Beaujolais Village, which has uh, carbonic maceration and all that candied confected type fruit along with stem, in, uh, stem inclusion. And then Grenache Blend, um, you would be thinking about something like Chateauneuf or Gigondas or Coderon Village, in which case, you know, you've got a blend, but you've also got, you know, wine made from grapes in a much warmer climate. And that would be reflected in the structure. Okay. So mm -hmm. what do we have for our results? Ah, everybody going Pinot and Game Un Poquito, as we say here in New Mexico. No other. I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody was going Toraldigo or Mark Samino. Okay. Uh, everybody's going to Oregon with it. Yep. Okay. And we've got France, tiny bit. Australia, tiny bit. Okay. So let's see where we are on the good ship. Goldstein, right. where are we going? I think we're headed due north. Something yeah. tells me. Yeah. So that obviously uh, Doug's winery is in the town of Buellton and not, it's like an urban winery and not out in a gorgeous vineyard. He purchases his fruit and brings Akeem it. Akeem is proclaiming before we land there that this is Oregon Pinot. Okay. And he thinks it's a killer example. Yeah, well, okay. here we go. We're heading in the right direction. As so Akeem, say, this right? is your moment to shine, buddy. <laughs> We, we are indeed, we're in the Willamette Valley. And um, yeah, so this is a wine from the Tendril Winery and it's Tony Renders. And, and Tony really is one of the most important people in the area. He's been there for a long time since, wow, the 80s. Um, 
He went to UC Davis, I think, and got his master's in enology in 92. Tindrill is his winery. I think it's been around since 2010. Before then, he has this amazing track record. I mean, he worked in Napa Valley right out of uh, UC Davis. He went to Italy, worked in Tuscany for Italy, went to Australia for a couple of years. And then from there, he was in Willamette Valley. He was the assistant winemaker at Argyle. He went north to Washington. He was a red winemaker at Hogue. That's where I first became aware of him. And then he went to Domaine Serene, which is one of the top producers in Oregon. And he was their winemaker there for 10 years, making brilliant wines. And then he started his own label, Tendril. Tendril, the little tiny green shoots that first appear in vines in the spring. And this is the second label. It's called Child's Play. He makes Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. He blends different sources, I think, from Eola uh, Yamhill and the Eola Hills, those two different sub appellations. And the idea being here to have an eminently drinkable, delicious Pinot Noir uh, that doesn't cost an arm and a leg, right? So again, this is child's play. I think there's a thousand cases of this made. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really tasty and very complex Pinot Noir for the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, he does. A, I mean, aside from the fact that the man is a proverbial living legend up in the Northwest and for, yeah. for good reason. And for those people who remember when Domaine Serene hit the scene, um, they were the it girl for the longest period of time. Obviously it's a little bit cr more crowded now, but they still make great wines at Domaine Serene. You know, but this to me too, if you're wondering how, why Oregon, it's got sort of a little bit of um, the spirit of the old world. To me, it's like new world Bourgogne Rouge with mm. uh, complexity, but mid palate, it's got that sweetness that um, yeah. that is the stamp to me of um, you know our continent. Yeah, and, and what uh, I think. Maddie, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, sorry, I mean, I, Manny. I would just add to that. That's a really good point because to me, the you know some people confuse uh, Lamet Pinots with uh, Burgundy, and to me, there's two differences. One is is that sweetness on the finish, and two, there's just you know the the Burgundy wines to me tend to be stimmier and they taste drier, even though right. they could. The wines could both be dry. They don't have that mid palate sweetness, right? Yeah. And they also they also tend to be harder, um, except mm -hmm. in the years that are you know the the so called millésime California, the California vintages like twenty or some nineteen or something like that. Um, and these wines can do that all the time. And they have you know they have enough Burgundian slash Kiwi herbal green sensibility that sun dried tomato character you you mentioned a little bit earlier, yet have that that wonderful mid palate plushness and sweetness that Madeline so uh, commented on as well too. Um, well, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll channel my inner Lee Mang for a minute. Let's move on to wine five <laughs> uh, and look at this wine against the white background. It's um, also, I can read through it. So it's, uh, I would say it's certainly not translucent when compared to the Pinot Noir, but nevertheless, thus it's not opaque. So it's probably got a good medium depth of color. When I roll it around my glass though, there's no real significant pigmentation, which leads me to believe it's not an, uh, a warmer climate, heavy stain, heavy pigmented grape, probably a medium type uh, grape there. The color itself is sort of uh, ruby. It is uh, starting to definitely fade at the edge. You could actually argue that's ruby, maybe pushing garnet. And then the edge is a little bit more sort of pink, pushing uh, salmon a little bit. And and, uh, and and the tearing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's tearing, but the tears are relatively thick and they're both first and secondary, which suggests to me you do have some ripeness there, whether it's by style, vintage or whatever. Um, it's definitely there. Let's go ahead and give it a sniff and ultimately a taste. Um, in terms of my fruit, earth, wood, is there fruit here? Absolutely. Um, I would say it's more red fruit, again, than black fruit. But I would say that that red fruit is a little bit more pushed. Again, could be style, could be warmer vintage. I'm getting plum. I'm getting cherry. Uh, I'm getting perhaps even just a little bit of pomegranate, all sort of in that ripe area and pushing dried. When I say dried here, not like dried, raisinated dried, but more like fruit leather dried for those people who remember that from your school lunchbox and stuff like that you get a bit of that sort of very intense character the black fruit that's there very much like tim described in the pinot noir is sort of tart and black so whether it's black cherry black raspberry maybe just a little hint of blackberry as well too and again very ripe very fresh and a little bit more in that fruit leather vein of things there's also coincidentally not by choice, not by, by pick on my end, because I wouldn't be that cool. There is a modicum of a, of a citrus uh, peel character to it, probably more like a dried orange peel element to it. And almost like there's a constant common tea, that sort of orangey tea thing that you pick up as well too. I'm getting flowers, but they're sort of dried, maybe a little bit of dried rose petal, something like that. There's licorice. 
There's a little bit of fennel. There's a bit of mint. There's a little bit of bay leaf. And then we hit oak. Um, I, Jerry, I'm not seeing any TCA in my wine. And God, I sure hope you're not finding it in yours. There's definitely a good kiss of oak on this wine. And I'm getting it in the form of vanilla. I'm getting it in the form of baking spice. I'm also picking up sort of that interesting element of, uh, of, of vanilla, nougatine, uh, that sort of Italian nougat character. Uh, but there's a lot of all of that sort of being driven by uh, by an oakiness or something like that in it. Uh, the wine definitely is showing development and age by nature of the dried character of the floral, the dried character of the herbs, that little bit of potpourri-ish element that I smelled there. So I'm and obviously amplified by its color in the mouth. The wine is obviously dry. The acid on it is medium plus. Um, it definitely is showing some development in age. The tannins on it are very smooth. They've, uh, I, I would say they were probably harder when they were a little bit younger, but over time, I think they've kind of calmed and polished themselves down. Uh, the fruit character is pretty consistent with what we talked about before. There's that whole other set of flavors, herbs and other uh, and spices and things like that that all sort of hit into an interesting profile, which I don't want to say, because if I say it, it'll give it away. And um, the wine has got nice length, very approachable, very drinkable right now, clearly showing some age, and a wine that I would say um, is a drink me now. Uh, I, I think it'll hold for another year or two, probably exactly where it is right now. And then after that, it'll start to, to fade off and gray at the temples, just like yours truly is here. As far as what it could be, let's take a look at our poll. Uh, we could be a Tempranillo or Tempranillo blend. Again, Tempranillo is oftentimes uh, not a, a wine made by itself, but oftentimes with other grapes, usually uh, Grenache and uh, Carignan with Tomatado, Graciano, etc., in, particularly in Spain. Pinot Noir, we know what Pinot Noir is like. Grenache blend, we had a nice conversation about that earlier. And then other, if you find something else that you think it could be, Throw it on out there in old world France and Spain, new word, Australia and California. There are a lot of Australians today, but we haven't found anything from Australia yet. And so go ahead and, and uh, vote there. Again, we just had a great example of a Pinot Noir, but don't let that uh, get you complacent to think that I might not throw a second Pinot Noir next to it. I've been known to do that. Grenache blend, Tim, I think talked about it before, and you need ripeness and richness there, which you admittedly have. But if you were to blend it with other grapes, what would those grapes be like? There'd be a certain flavor profile and then Tempranillo. So that's it. Vote, vote early, vote often, and let's see what we've got. Let's see what we've got. And we've got a lion's share of people in Tempranillo land, a couple of people in other. I did see, uh, then I think you put down um, uh, Sangiovese before, and, and Sangiovese would be an interesting choice, and you would be clearly in Italy or perhaps in South America somewhere. But uh, most people ended up in Spain, and most people ended up there. And um, as we get on the plane, I guess, Tim, just a quick word on the difference between Tempranillo and Sangiovese, another pair of your evil twins as we hop on the plane here. Yeah, Evan, good question. You know, the, the main difference is a uh, little bit of favor, flavor profile, but it's structure, it's tannin and uh, acid. I think is temp Tempranillo, does, it's, it's, you know, moderate in the tannin department, uh, Sangiovese, uh, even for something like Chianti Classico, it can have both grape tannins and uh, mm -hmm. oak tannins. And you get a lot of tannin in the front of the mouth and the wine is acidic and it is dry mm -hmm. and uh, just finishes with a cherry pit. This is a kinder and gentler. And then also shout out to just the, you know, the the people that were saying, well, oh, there's VA in the wine and it's not corked, but there are touches of VA and Brett in the wine. And just a reminder that aside from TCA and maybe sulfur compounds, you know, most of what we call faults are contextual. And here they both add to the character of the wine. Yeah, yeah. And I think they're very much part of the DNA, both of this wine, uh, also of this particular house, which we'll learn about in a minute. So we are uh, hopping back on that we're doing a fast forward here because we talked right through it. But we left, um, we left where we were in Oregon and we are now in Spain. We are in the northern part of Spain. We are in the Appalachian of Rioja uh, and we are at the venerable house of uh, Bodegas Faustino. 
Um, when we talk about Spanish wine, certainly from a non-fortified standpoint, because obviously sherry has got its own sort of thinking there, but from a table wine standpoint, Rioja is unquestionably uh, the most legacy, the most celebrated, and the largest production of, of high-quality red wines in Spain today. Um, I would argue that this particular house of Faustino um, has been along with this Rioja. Here, and you'll notice that Rioja uh, is, is broken up into three areas. You have the Alta. Uh, in the north uh, western part, you have the Alavesa, which sits just to the north of the uh, Ebro River there in the uh, Basque country. And then you have the Rioja Oriental, formerly the Rioja Baja in the in the site. Most people will blend amongst the areas. Sometimes people are single estates and all that. The people at Faustino own land in both the Rioja Alavesa and the Rioja Oriental. And this wine is a nice split uh, mix of those two things. Uh, Faustino dates back 163 years. Uh, they are um, a classic house. They are considered very much an old school house. Um, if you've seen their Grand Reserva, of which they are literally responsible for 40% of the Grand Reserva produced in Spain, it comes in that very distinctive frosted glass bottle with the wire netting on it um, and is as ubiquitous in the brains of people when they think about Grand Reserva as the fiasco uh, straw bottles are for Chianti. Um, I think they do a fabulous job across the board. Um, they own uh, the winery is extraordinary. Um, it's at once very modern, but also um, has very much a tip of the past into to the uh, to the old school of what they do. And again, I think if you break up Rioja into tradicionalistas and modernistas, and then the tweeners, these guys are definitely more of the traditionalists. The wine itself, they're uh, they're Faustino Cinco. Of uh, which this is the 2015 vintage, by the way, I would add, made uh, well here by uh, Juan Jose Diaz Gonzalez, their day to day winemaker, uh, it is a blend of 90% uh, Tempranillo and 10% Mazuelo, being a synonym for Canignan, and is a pretty consistent mix across the board. They do have some Graciano, but they don't actually put it in this particular wine. And uh, I think they do a, a, an absolutely fabulous job. Um, the, the sort of traditionalist style speaks, as Tim spoke about before, that that certain amount, particularly in Europe, you find this certain amount of, you know, of, of slight faults, you know, the slight blemish that you find here actually adds to the character and to the DNA and is partially why they are traditionalists and not making sort of squeaky clean um, stuff. Uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag team on that and say, you know, and I don't work for Faustino, but I got to tell you, uh, you know, this is a 2015. This has yeah. extended barrel age and bottle age. And it 24 comes months, off, 24 it comes months off of barrel. fresh, yeah. not just on the palate, but on um, even on the way it looks. And mm -hmm. I think that these people have been around for that long. They haven't been sitting on their hands. And Mr. Gonzalez is doing a good job riding two horses between, um, you know, embracing tradition, but making sure that they have... Uh, modern sensibilities in terms of cleanliness and awareness and play. Nobody's asleep making this wine. It's really good. And I love, Tim, that you brought home um, the the tannin quality difference between um, Tempranillo and um, Sangiovese. If I can riff on that for a moment, because for me, you know, what always distinguishes itself in Sangiovese is that perfect balance between poignant acidity and, you know, significant tannins, albeit often finely grained, whereas with Tempranillo, maybe it's moderated by the wood as well. The tannin just isn't a prominent factor when yeah. you're um, when you're talking about um, the structure of the wine. Did, um, Evan, this is a combination of French and American oak? Yeah, no, mostly I, I would say there's a tiny, tiny bit of French oak, but they're pretty much committed to American oak because they have been. But I do want to reiterate uh, before I turn it over to you, Madeline, for that last last but not least line. Um, a couple of things. Number one, they use all 225 liter French, mm -hmm. mostly French oak barrels, um, used uh, Amer American oak barrels rather, which is sort of the formula for Rioja, the traditional there. But I do want to point out that for Reserva, you're looking at a minimal one a year of oak and a minimal two of bottle age. And this has got two years of oak and significant bottle age because this is their current release on the market mm. for a Reserva. And it's an eight-year-old. But that's wine. American oak that's beautifully handled. They have yeah, their own no. uh, facilities, don't they? They they don't cooper their, their own oak, I, I don't believe, but they are, but they are, I believe, the largest barrel owners um, in all, as the air, 
as in all of Rioja and amongst, uh, I think the only facility uh, or company that owns more oak than they do in the world is Jackson Family Wines, which is quite mm -hmm. interesting. I did <laughs> want to point out one thing before I turn it over, Madeline, to get on that last wine, is that in San Giovese and in um, Tempranillo, the clones change, right? In Rioja, has very little to do with Ribera del Duero and Toro in terms of the clone of Good Tempranillo point. that they use there and the robustness right. of the wines. There is a speltness to the wines there. And as we all know, Chianti, whether it's classical Rufina or straight Chianti versus say Brunello and Montalcino, also two different clones, two different uh, types of things. So anyway, that said, Madeline, let's move on to wine number six. I don't want to shortchange this one. Oh, I have... Over 10 minutes. Are you yeah. kidding me? I'm tiptoeing through the tulips on this This wine is worth it. Yeah. But uh, I will say parting shot. Did you notice on the label, talk about one foot in the past and one in the future. They are putting the dominant grape on the label, Tempranillo. Yeah. And I really herald them for doing that because especially when you're selling to the American market, we are varietal driven and I don't think it's any sort of sellout to do that. So that said, was my little speech. Okay, we are looking at this and now for something completely different in terms of the visuals of this wine. Just take it against the white surface. Li Meng, we're remembering you. And on, on an angle, you know, still to this day, I see wine professionals do this. You're going to see the ceiling tiles or the floor tiles if you go that way. But, you know, and just turn it. And it doesn't stain the glass. It paints the glass. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a wine that... Um, you know, uh, even just looking at it, we know that it is uh, not a thin-skinned, larger red grape variety or varieties, right? Remember, to Tim's point, could be a mono varietal or could be a blend. Um, I mean, it's glorious in terms of its concentration, but very interesting. I love the appearance of wine. It really excites me. You can't put your finger underneath it. You can't see a damn thing, right? So it's opaque, but it's a true, the darkest ruby. And then let your eye follow it to the very rim. It lightens up within a quarter inch towards the rim. And it's just starting to turn towards yellow, possibly. I have terrific light in my room. So it makes you really pay attention to rim variation. This is not um, mono hue. There's a little bit of gradation in this wine. I'm just bringing your attention to that. Um, in terms of how it moves in the glass, it's positively sludgy. Not an official <laughs> wine term, but it speaks to um, extract and alcohol, correct? In addition to um, thick skin grape variety or um, grape varieties, it really paints the picture of a wine that is um, extracted and young, but not born yesterday. And aromatically wowie so immediately i get hit by a wall of fruit but on the right behind it is da -da 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 -da, all this complexity going on so let's um let's perceive and define madeline what is hitting you first is a combination of red blue and black fruit all with perfect exuberant ripeness not moving into jammy land but almost right it's not cooked but it is um almost uh, flipping into that zone. Um, the black fruit is black raspberry, black currant. The blueberry is, you know, blue fruit is blueberry, have a nice day. The red fruit is um, very rich um, red raspberry. I don't think cherry, red currant. And it is rare to me that I smell a wine where those three uh categories of red berries are, rec are are represented almost in equal balance, at least aromatically. It may change on the plat palate. Once I perceive and define that and get it out of the way, I do smell oak, but it's integrated oak. There is, uh, you know, some vanillin, some cedar, some cigar box, but it's not sitting on the fruit, nor is it interfering with it. It's really well integrated. There is a very neat, beautiful florality to this wine that is a combo of, um, of uh, you know, lavender and rose, both fresh and, and dry, like potpourri-esque. There is a really neat organic earth element that comes across to me like uh, fresh truffles. Haven't we gotten around to like declaring truffle oil illegal or something <laughs> like that? You know what I mean? It's just, God, 
<laughs> but it shouldn't belong in the culinary universe as an option. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but there's a mushroom and fresh truffle element to the aromatics that really adds complexity. There's also a green element that is more minty than anything else, high-toned mint, um, maybe pyrazine, but I mean, barely a whisper of it. I don't want that to, you know, cloud your judgment too much. There is um, inorganic minerality as well. There's a rockiness in the smell of this wine, though it isn't up front and center, it's in there. The wine is not bereft of it. And often when you're struggling between Europe and the rest of the universe, you might ask yourself, uh, you know, were you, if there's a whisper of minerality, what would it smell like if it were not there? This has it, you know, it's in there, though it's not a dominant factor. I'm going to go ahead and taste it. It smells wonderful. I just want to sit here and sort of <laughs> vini di meditazione on the nose. Mm. The palate doesn't disappoint. And I will tell you, after a million years on the floor, the delish factor is important to me. And this has got it. The attack is, wowie, I just got chills. This combination of red, blue, and black fruit Though I think on the palate, no, I would say they're equally balanced. It's the damnedest thing. And it's very rare that I perceive that. Very interesting structurally. Hello, tannins. There you are. And you are medium plus. You are quite drying, but not what I would call severe. They are not soft tannins. This is not uh, what I would call a gentle round um, mouthfeel but the tannins are um, kind of like just the right amount of salt and pepper in um, a salt. You know, it pulls it up a little bit, it tightens it up a little bit. The acidity, let's not forget, um, is actually medium plus also. Um, and and the, mouth, the wine is both mouth-watering and nicely drying. I can taste through it. Um, interestingly, if I'm being honest, the finish is slightly short, but this is to its credit, and I'll tell you why. I often personally feel that young red wine, um, you know, will be very expressive on the nose, medium plus expressive on the palate, and sometimes cinch up at the end just because it doesn't have its act together yet, and it's not displaying length, so I don't see that. At, it's more of a textural length as opposed to a flavor um length but it's not uh, a demerit in the least so this to me is um full-bodied full-flavored um rich perfectly ripe verging on jammy red blue and blackberry fruit with strong um dried and fresh floral elements a little bit of uh mint both organic and inorganic earth as a ps you know it's a it's a it's a sidebar it's not a dominant factor perfectly integrated, high quality oak. And I would say blended oak, new oak does not sit on this wine. And, you know, uh, I sound like I made it because I'm being enthusiastic, but I really think it's a beautiful wine. All right. So uh, let's see what- Was I too might... enthusiastic, Tim? No, and, you uh, weren't. I, I, I'm sitting here. I'm actually literally speechless. I, it's wine is- um... I'm drinking the damn thing. Yeah, I'm not yeah, driving anywhere yeah. in Detroit. Tonight, and I, and so. I think also <laughs> just before, as the poll comes up and we start to figure out what mm -hmm. we might have here, uh, I think you pointed out a really interesting fact, which is that although the wine doesn't have that sort of acid driven, go on forever kind of thing that a young wine does, it's perfect. That, and I don't think- I think this wine is going to age for years oh, magnificently. and years and it, and it doesn't have yes. to. Oftentimes mm -hmm. you need that acid to carry mm -hmm. the wine through because otherwise it falls off a cliff. This wine, even if, you know, if it stayed exactly the same, which it won't in terms of its structure and all that, it is going to age for, for decades. Magnificently. And you yeah. know, the, 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 the rim gave us a hint. It wasn't born yesterday, but it's got a beautiful voyage ahead of itself. So what are we considering? Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon blend. Um, Malbec blend and Syrah blend. It doesn't mean it has to be a blend. It means those grape varieties um, open the door for those options. Regionally, Italy, which would um, apply more to uh, Cabernet and possibly a little Syrah, especially in the super Tuscan, um, you know, uh, universe. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon for 
um, France as well from Europe. You know, Malbec just doesn't figure that big time into France unless it's Cahors and you can consider it, right? Um, Syrah, uh, France, sure. Argentina, Malbec, Cabernet, and Syrah, but definitely Malbec and Cabernet. Don't forget Argentine uh, Cabernet. It, it rocks and rolls. And Washington State, which uh, I actually changed that because I think that it's important to consider Washington State both for Syrah and uh, Cabernet in um, the United States. And what right. I think is going to be very interesting is seeing how you use deductively that um, presence of both organic and inorganic earth in this wine, because it's there. How much does it command your attention? How much of a factor is it? You know, it does play into the complexity of the wine. We have 46% um, pushing 50, voting for Cabernet. 15% um, for Malbec. The florality would definitely lead, lead you there. And Syrah, 38%, um, which is significant. Now, I have to admit, I didn't pick up any of my personal tells for Syrah, which doesn't mean it isn't, aka a meatiness or, um, you know, an overt uh, peppery quality. Um, and we've got strong votes for France and Washington State. Yay, Washington. Yay, Doug. Um, with uh, um, a strong hat tip to Argentina, but not a dominant one. Huh. And other, please put it in the chat room. Tim, you are like masterful at handling the chat. Can you see if anyone's coming to the fore with uh, what they think it is other than these grape varieties? Shall we reveal? Sure. We are over time. Yeah, please hang in it. there, everybody. This is a great wine. Yeah. Don't shortchange this wine. No. So um, we are, where were we? We are, oh, in Spain. <laughs> We're, the we long are, flight, right? we're leaving Europe. We are going to, I'll just say it out loud in front of God and everybody, we are going to Argentina. You know, this is um, a beautiful example of why, you know, as good as Malbec can be from Argentina, Cabernet Sauvignon, if you're not paying attention to it, you are cheating yourself big time, both uh, in terms of enjoyment of uh, very high quality uh, potential and also, you know, um, is an alternative to Cabernet Sauvignon from elsewhere. This is from Tapis, which means um, uh, tapestry, actually. And it is run by um, a very strong, brilliant woman. The name of this wine is Retrato, which means portrait. I had to look this up. That's why God invented, uh, you know, translation apps. It is from a very interesting, relatively new GI. Um, this was cool. I actually had to look it up because I hadn't experienced it on the label before. San Pablo, which it was uh, accepted as a GI in 2021. It's part of the Tunuyan, uh, whatever we want to call it. I guess I'd call it a province, which is nestled between San Carlos and Tupungato. So we're talking the Uco Valley. And yes, we are soaring well above 4,000 feet above sea level. I just love that. Having been there, it is bloody high desert. You know, you've got a cactus looking at you, right? And you've got daytime temperatures that are high with blazing ultraviolet light, uh, where the, to the point where they're canopying their best vineyards to protect them a little bit. And then you've got 40 to 50 degree plummets at night. Ergo, that acidity is beautifully natural. Um, this is a portrait for a gentleman called Jean-Claude um Bedouet. Who, yes Bedouet, who was for 44 years part of the winemaking team at drumroll Chateau Petrus so that you know handshake from Bordeaux is actual and there he is um mm -hmm. I think this is a wonderful example of um a collaboration between you know uh Europe and uh, I'm gonna, just gonna say new world you know there's a little bit of discussion these days about whether we should use that terminology or not. I don't think there's anything wrong with using it. It, it, it expresses uh, a sentiment to me that is true and simple. And I think what you have is uh, high altitude, very high altitude uh, quality fruit that is expressing, um, you know, terroir in a deep sense um, with a French sensibility weighing in 
and also um, uh, management of winemaking technique, especially to the point of not over oaking of uh, this very high quality fruit. Wait for it, the cepage. 60%-ish Cabernet Sauvignon, 30%-ish Cabernet Franc, not a drop of Malbec, 10%-ish Merlot and a skosh of Petit Verdot. So ergo, there's the expression of red, uh, black, and blue fruit, though it really surprised me, even shocked me that we didn't have any Malbec in this blend. And we've got a combination of first, second, and third use uh, oak barrels. Evidently, the vineyard is contained completely within uh, the San Pablo estate of uh, Tapiz. And even, um, you know, I don't look at uh, critical press, even though I, I officially work uh, a chunk of the time for a very high quality retailer, and I'm proud of it, and critical press matters. But when I look at um, uh, sources like Venice, and they rate it very highly, you know, this means something to me because this is uh, uh, New World and Old World doing a very successful dance together. Did I represent that nicely, Evan? You, you absolutely. In the, you're yeah. the South American maven, baby. Not yeah, no, you are. And he said, what's amazing to me about Jean-Claude is the mm -hmm. second man from the left there in the photo is he hasn't aged a bit. And he's all, part of because he works all the time. You know, everyone thought once he was done with uh, Petrus, he would, he would fade off into the sunset and drink, you know, tiki drinks on the beach somewhere. But not only does he have this very active project down in, in Argentina with Patricia Ortiz and family, but he also has his own project down in Irolegui, you know, from Basque country where he's from and doing oh, stuff right. like that. Oh, right. That stuff's great. Yeah, I, yeah. And they're reasonably priced, both Ab Blanc and Rouge. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. But this is, this is um, you know, uh, you know, they're a perfect match made in heaven. You know, the two of them work well together. You know, he actually... Uh, spent a lot of time researching whether he wanted to do it. Obviously, everyone would love to ride the coattails of his reputation and his name and his skill set, but he found um, a perfect project. And this wine is, you know, it's not an inexpensive wine. Delighted that we were able to, to show it for you. What is the retail on this? Oh, if you go back to, go back a couple of slides, Silka, for us to show us what the cost mm -hmm. on the wine is. Oop, one more. Oh, $110. $110. Well, so you, know, you guys rate, <laughs> you guys rate, uh, well, but with the Petrus reputation and everything, they can do that. It's a 2017 um, and it's still showing so young. I mean, it's interesting. 400 two, cases produced, tiny. Yeah, 2015 mm -hmm. on the uh, Rioja, mm -hmm. 2017 on this. So we're giving you some aged wines in here and some quality wines at that. So as we close up shop here and get ready for the happy half hour, a couple of things until next time. First of all, I just want to say, that the uh, bottle of uh, Rioja that had the gold capsule on it is not because it's the best wine. It's not because <laughs> it's the golden ticket wine and you want to call me up now and and turn in your bottle uh, cap for uh, Master of the World or something like that. And it's not a short capsule wine from Spain. It was just a little holiday something we were bottling in December. And it's kind of like, you know, when you have fingernail polish on and one one's a different color than the other for a statement. I just thought that would be fun. Anyway, I digress. Let's talk about next time. So uh, February 16th uh, is kit 151A. Uh, for those of you who are regular subscribers, um, it'll be in your in your uh, ship to you shortly. Um, another new, new set of wines continuing with what we do. Uh, you can access it through the QR code there. Same, uh, same bat channel, same uh, bat time at 1 p.m., but this time on February 16th. I wanna make a big highlight um, to Madeline's selection of wines that we have in that sense of uh, we have people who are very interested in having testable wines because they're getting ready for that. And this is uh, Madeline's idea, Madeline's brainchild. We work together on putting together- My love sets, letter to you. Yes. Love letter to me of wines that rotate out, but would be considered on exams and things like that. Uh, you can get them in six or 12 at a shot. And we work hard to work with you that if you're ordering them on a regular basis, as you are prepping for an exam, you don't get the same hit twice. So that's a good thing. And then lastly, a couple of other thoughts for uh, ideas for till next time. One, we had huge interest in this uh, relationship we developed with Somify. Uh, Somify is a board game. It's a blind tasting board game. Imagine Candyland meets MTW. And there you've got it. That's what this is. Shoots and ladders, something like that. But it's really fun. It's playful. It's festive. And you get to do 
blind tasting and stuff at the same time. Um, so you get the board and the game and a kit all together. It's a lot of fun. And then at the holidays, we're going to keep these going because they were so popular. We offer this two bottle pillow sampler, uh, which is like a perfect host, host or hostess gift or something like that, rather than bringing people, quote unquote, just a single bottle of wine or flowers or whatever. Um, you can bring these two little uh, MTW bottles and uh, we give you guys all a good deal on it because you're friends and family, if you will. So lots of cool stuff moving forward. And with that, we're going to take the last 20 minutes here. We're going to shorten our happy half hour. I think nobody minds because we spent a little bit of extra time on that last wine. And we're going to go ahead and, and open it up for people. Um, so if you want to show yourself on screen, you are available and able to do so. Uh, if you don't, you want to stay in the background, you can do it if you need to run off. Thank you much for so much for uh, being with us as always. And uh, with that, Soka, if you want to open it up for everybody. Um, and take Those us who are off. running off, by the way, yeah. do yourself a favor and go from your reds and beeline to your whites. Truly, because they yeah. often make them pop. And uh, especially, you know, that whole little wrestle between number one and number two in terms of varietal recognition, it might be uh, useful to you. Just a thought. All right. Okay. Um, Silka, if you want to turn off and just do turn off the thing so we can do a big uh, we can get out of the presentation and see everybody at the same time, that would be great.